a theory that promises to be a theory of quantum gravity. In fact, when we study the bosonic string, we got fairly close. We got something that has gravity. It's in 25 plus 1 dimensions. That would have been also fine if it wasn't for the fact that, first of all, the theory has this nasty tachyon. I told you that in the open string sector, we understand what the tachyon does. But in the closed string sector, it's still a mystery. So we have this closed string tachyon. Which, as far as we know, is something bad. Okay. And everything was bosonic, so in space time, we just got only bosons in space time. Then the most pressing question was is there any way we can get fermions in space time? Right? So we started with the RNS string. And we have been studying the open string. Okay. So today, we will finish with the open string in the RNS model. And what we're going to find, of course, Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. We're going to find fermions in space-time. OK? But our open screen spectrum will not have gravity. Remember, where did we find gravity? In the closed stream. So we will have to move to the closed stream sector. We will have to do closed strings in order to find <coughs> gravity. So what's the goal of the next few lectures? Well, as it turns out, once you study the closed string, we will find that there are at least two possibilities. Okay? We will find that there will be two theories that we can construct which are very different. Okay? So the goal of the course, or where we are heading, is a classification of the string theories. Well, nowadays I have to be careful because there are many string theories. Um, some of them are called topological string theories. But the goal of this course is a classification of physical string theories. So hopefully today or tomorrow, we will study the closed string. And we will find that there are two such theories. There will be two theories of closed superstrings. which turn out to be supersymmetric, and they will have two supersymmetries each. We will also find, perhaps tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, we will find two more string theories, which are closed superstrings, which have n equals 1 supersymmetries. And we will find one more later on that also has one supersymmetry. So the goal of the course is to fill this up with the five different super strings that we know of. Okay? And then you probably have seen this picture. That at the beginning, people thought that there were 
different, different models, as we're going to see, they look very different. We find them as different possibilities for the spectrum. But they all turn out to be related and unified in a single framework. So the goal of the course is basically to fill up this diagram. OK? Yes. Those of the n equals one are all, all open strings. No. These ones are also. These two are also closed strings. Very good question. And this one is an open string. Of course, remember when you have open strings, you can also have closed strings because they can join and produce a closed string. You remember the little diagram that we drew in the different regimes. You can have, but this. These four don't have open strings. This one has this one has open strings. All right, very good. But in order to get there, I'm afraid that we will have to work really hard. <laughs> so. Let's continue with what we did yesterday. So yesterday we started, or we ended, by writing our first supergravity Lagrangian. Want to get all the factors right. And why did we do this? Why did we have to introduce supergravity on the wall sheet? Do you remember? There was not enough constraint. Excellent, yeah. That's right. So we started with a naive approach, and we found that it was a disaster. We had a spectrum. We had a theory that wasn't unitary. So we had to go back to the drawing board and be honest. We gave it, we gave it a shot with just this piece, and we found that still we didn't have enough constraints. And then I think it was Aitor, who's not here today, <laughs> who said, well, but there is a solution. You can add more constraints. <laughs> <laughs> so you can add more constraints if you had supersymmetry, because then you can have the super partner of the, of the previous one. So this action has diffuse plus Local SUSI, okay. It also has vial invariance plus super vial invariance. And we said, although we didn't prove it, but I encourage you to try, we said that this is enough. These are enough redundancies in order to eat up all the degrees of freedom of the metric, and we can allow us to set them to be the flat space metric. And it also allows us to set the gravitino to zero. Okay? So we said, well, big deal. Once we do this, we go back to the naive action we wrote down at the very beginning. What have we gained? Well, what we have gained is that we have to remember that once we do this, we have to impose the constraints. <coughs> And the constraints. So here I'm going to go back to, well, let's write it like this first. This is a constraint. And now we have to get something that comes from the variation of the action with respect to the gravitino. And that will be the gravitino equations. Of course, we will set them. to the value that we want to use. So the gravitino will be set to 0, and the metric will be set to eta to beta after we compute this variation. <coughs> Very good. 
Very good. So, <coughs> Yes. Well, how it comes that people take this problem more serious than the tech kings? Because Which problem? The problem of unitarity? Yeah. Well, as, as we discussed, a tachyon, what it's really telling you is that you're expanding around an unstable vacuum, right? In quantum field theory. But we couldn't solve it for the... For the closed stream. Right. But we're doing the super stream, so maybe things will be different. Let's be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, you never know, right? So we're changing the theory dramatically. We're introducing fermions now. Maybe something will happen. Okay? If you still, if you still have a closed stream tachyon, then... Okay. Then, then, we, then we'll worry. Okay? Yeah. Very good. So we have this. Now, um, remember, in the case of the closed string, it was useful to use new coordinates <clears throat> like on coordinates on the world sheet, right? And then the constraints say T plus plus ended up being something very nice. Right? Where this square means what? Remember? This square meant the contraction of the space-time indices. So the contraction of this thing, this is a vector, so we're computing the norm square. But now we also have fermions. So I think there is a factor of two. We will have something that looks like this, if you compute it. Where, once again, remember, this plus here means chirality. Well, this plus means derivative with respect to sigma plus. Okay? So the constraint we have to impose is that this is equal to zero, and we have t minus minus. It's the same thing, but with minuses everywhere. Okay? So let's see if I got the, the signs right. Yep. All right. How about the new constraints? Well, people like to call the new constraints. I didn't give them a name there, but I could have. J alpha. <coughs> so note that when you take the variation with respect to the gravitino, only the last two terms will contribute. And the first term, I shouldn't do this. So we will get a contribution from this term that basically picks up this, and a contribution from the second term that will still have one gravitino left, right? This is quadratic. But we're going to set it so that we set the gravitino to zero. So this piece will not contribute to the constraint. So if you do the computation carefully in these new coordinates, you will find that the constraint is something of the form okay and you will also find another one j minus equals to psi mu okay so let's give it a shot and see if we can fix the problem of the spectrum Yes. This this current is just. Oops. What happened? <coughs> is it not working? Sorry. Take it down first. Oh, it doesn't commute. Nice. Yes. And this current is the current of, of the the supersymmetry charge, right? The one that. Yes. Works with. Yes. You could you could think about that that way. Yes. Okay. So how uh, is there any physical way to see why it should vanish apart from uh, since from the gravity? No. Well, it, it would be the super partner of this. So if if you're setting this to zero, you should also set okay. this to zero. Right. But I prefer this other version. I mean, this is more physical. It said well. This is what you're doing, really. OK, so let's now, let's now see if this fixes our problems. <coughs> so last time, in our first attempt, 
we use the light concave quantization. Remember, there the trick is to use coordinates of this form and realize that the action after we do all that is something that looks very simple. And this has some residual symmetry, which in this case is super conformal invariance. And like on gauge quantization, you might wonder why is it called gauge or like on gauge. Well, the reason this is called like that is that you use the super conformal invariance or the redundancy that you have, and you choose a gauge where you purposely fix this guy to be something of this form. Okay. <clears throat> and using the super part of the superconformal invariance, you can now set <coughs> psi plus, sorry, the plus component of both of these guys to be zero. But we also said yesterday that the negative norm states could, be, could still be produced by the alpha minus oscillators and the <coughs> B minus or D minus oscillators. Remember, this minus means the space-time components. We also have the plus minus for the chirality and the plus minus for the derivatives in the Lycon, in the, in Lycon coordinates on the world sheet. Okay. <coughs> Very good, so we have that. Let's see if our constraints can help us fix the problem. Now, the alpha minus, we know we can use the T plus plus equal to zero constraint and write this as something that looks like derivative with respect to X plus of X minus with a minus. Remember, we are now computing the square of that vector, so we get two times this thing plus... This is a sum over i. And we get the same thing for the second term. So we get something that looks like plus, plus, derivative with respect to plus, psi. So this would be plus, say, minus, plus i half psi minus, derivative minus psi plus. So if I get all these signs correctly, there will be a miracle. But you guys are awake today, right? So you can tell me. Oh, you didn't tell me about this, right? This one is a plus. <laughs> I think this is it, right? <laughs> this is equal to zero. And here we're summing over i. We're not this I, but only this I. <laughs> okay. Well, the good thing here is that this guy is just basically a number. Okay? This is proportional to P plus. These guys are good guys. Psi plus is something we're setting to zero. So it's not here. And these guys are also good oscill oscillators. So that means that del plus x minus is equal to or proportional to 1 over p plus times the sum of good oscillators, bosonic and fermionic. <coughs> Now plugging in the expansion for x plus for x minus here, and now projecting on every oscillator mode, we can write down every alpha minus 
So that equation will give us every alpha minus oscillator as a function of transverse oscillators, <coughs> bosonic, and fermionic. But that we knew, right? That's the thing we did yesterday. The thing that was worrying us <coughs> were the other ones. But now let's look at the J plus constraint. <coughs> so we have the J plus constraint, and once again, we can do psi plus del plus x minus plus psi minus del plus x plus. <coughs> Remember that we need a minus sign when we do the inner product when we compute the inner product using the, using the Lycon coordinates, we need a minus sign. So we get this plus psi i sum over i del plus xi. This must be equal to 0. This guy is equal to 0. And this guy here is, again, something that looks like p plus. And from here, we get directly that psi minus is 1 over p plus the sum of only transverse oscillators. OK? So we got unitarity. At least we're dealing with a theory that makes sense. OK? We can go ahead and quantize it, build a Hilbert space that makes sense. But the whole idea of doing these exercises with fermions on the wall sheet, the, really mo the, the real motivation was, what was the motivation of doing all this? What do we want to find? What was the goal? Spectrum. Yes, we want to compute the spectrum. But the motivation for introducing fermions on the wall sheet from the beginning was to find fermions in space time. Oh, to find the standard model, yes. <laughs> of course, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to make it there. If you only had like 30 more lectures. That's what we wanted to do, to find a space-time fermion. <clears throat> Who has a chance of being a space-time fermion? So our best candidate at the moment are the states in the Ramon sector. The reason we found that the vacuum is a spinner in a space-time. OK, so we have our vacuum, where this index goes from 1 to the dimension of the spinner representation. I'm not writing explicitly what this representation is, because if d happens to be, the dimension of the space-time happens to be odd or happens to be even, and depending on when it's even, depending on what value it actually is, modulo a, the irreducible representations will have different, different dimensions. <coughs> okay? So this is the vacuum in the Ramon sector. It's a generator, and it's a spinner in space-time. So this is our best candidate. And yesterday, we said that we're missing something. If we could only find 
that this guy has to satisfy the Dirac equation in a space time, then we will be done. Okay. So how can we produce a, a Dirac equation? Well, as you can see in this business, life is a little bit tough in the sense that we don't have much things to play with. We only have the constraints and nothing else. So in the bosonic case, we took our energy momentum tensor And we decompose this in Fourier mode. Okay, so we should do the same thing <coughs> for our fermionic currents. So remember, we now want to do the Ramon sector because that's the only chance we have of getting our space-time fermions. So let's call F M the mode expansion or the Fourier mode expansion of J plus. Okay? So you just sit down, plug in the formula for what these guys are. You use a formula for X mu in the open <coughs> string with Neumann boundary conditions. You put it in here, and you will find something that looks like Now, there is something nice about this. You see that these two guys commute among themselves. So we don't have any normal order and ambiguity. That means that as a quantum operator, we should require that any physical state is annihilated by all these guys. <coughs> well, let's look at our Ramon state, ground state. And just out of curiosity, or in other words, let's start from the beginning. Let's compute what F0 acting on the Ramon state is, on the vacuum state is. Okay? So choose set M equals to 0. And we know that this has to be equal to 0. This is a constraint. But if you look at what this is, so first of all, we have to put zeros everywhere. So this is equal to the sum of, of these guys. Now. Who is going to survive when acting on the vacuum? <laughs> Out of this infinite sum of terms, right, all these guys will be annihilation operators, so they will, be, they will start killing the, the vacuum. And the only thing that will survive is actually the n equals to 0 term. So F0 acting on A only receives a contribution, or the only piece that is not 0 is from the alpha zero oscillator, or the n equals to zero term. OK? But now we have to use everything that we have done in the past, in the past, I don't know, maybe, yeah, almost from the beginning. Because we have to remember what alpha zero is. Alpha zero ended up being proportional to what? To the momentum of the string. Okay. Yesterday I also told you that I should also introduce the label that I never write, right, which is P. So alpha zero ended up being the momentum. And how about this zero? Ended up being proportional to what? the gamma matrices in a space-time. 
And therefore, this equation means what? If we use this, we use those equations, we get that P mu gamma mu acting on our vacuum has to be zero. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? We just found the Dirac equation for a massless spinner in a space time. As we said yesterday, this is P slash acting on This is a massless Dirac equation. So indeed, our attempt was successful. We found our first honest fermion in a space time. Well, but as they say, once you find one, there surely would be many. And we said that once you apply these operators, the creation operators of alphas and Ds on the vacuum, they all carry vector indices. Right? All our operators carry vector indices in space-time. That was the starting point. The Ds and the alphas all have mu's on top. Right? So when you act on the Ramon ground state and you compute in what representation they are, you will always have a spinner representation times, or it will be the tensor product of a spinner representation with tons of vector representations. And that always ends up being a fermion in space time. So the Ramon sector, the full Ramon sector, will give us an infinite tower of fermions. And it so happens that the ground state is massless. Okay? Very good. So what do we have to do now? I think we can follow Ellis's uh, suggestion and move on to see what the spectrum is. Why do we want to check the spectrum? Do you remember last time in the bosonic string, we checked the spectrum in order to search for any signs of tachyons. breaking of, of what? Of, vacu of tachyons. Yeah, OK, tachyons, yeah. No, tachyons were a byproduct. We were, our goal was to check something else, right? Was to check what? We were in the search for maybe along the way, we did some violent things, right? So we used. <laughs> We use these funny coordinates that break, that make Lorentz invariance completely, I mean, completely non-manifest, right? So we had to check if we were doing something wrong to Lorentz invariance, right? And one way to learn if this thing, if this theory was preserving Lorentz invariance, was to check the spectrum, right? So that's what we want to do now. We're just following exactly what we did in the bosonic case. So maybe we can just divide it here. Yesterday we used the two the two sets of blackboards, one for the for the NS sector and the other set for the Ramon sector, but today we will just use the same blackboard. Let's see if I can keep up with this notation. I'll try to say, well, there is a number operator for the NSS sector, and there is an ordering ambiguity for the NSS sector. And there would also be the same thing for the Ramon sector. I think it might be convenient to 
write this as follows. So if you follow the same steps as we did in the, in the bosonic case, no, okay, shouldn't be that lazy. I mean, I should do it here. So let's write what this number operator is. Remember the bosonic string, the bosonic part is just the sum over the transverse oscillators of what? Okay. And we will get a new piece here. So let's write the same thing here. So I tried to avoid, I wanted to avoid writing the same thing twice, but I don't think there is any way. Okay. So in the Navier-Schwarz sector, we get something that looks like In the Ramon sector, we get okay. Very good. So, just as in the case of, those, of the bosonic string, let's study sector by sector, or at least the first ones. So we have the NS sector with number operator zero. What is that guy? Well, that guy is the vacuum, right? So we have the vacuum. And this is what we get by applying this formula on the vacuum. We just get this contribution because the number operator is zero. This starts to look a little bit dangerous, right? It's like bringing bad bad memories, this minus A and S here. Well, I told you, let's be optimistic. Let's look at the next stage, just as we did in the, in the case of the bosonic string, it was N equals to one. Is that the same, is that, is, is that the next level in, this, in, in, in the super string? Can we produce something with a smaller, with a smaller number operator eigenvalue? Why would that be? A half, excellent. So we can produce a half. So that would be the next one. And how do we produce it? Well, we produce it by looking at a state that has B minus a half I acting on the vacuum. So this is our state. So this state has an index I. And we plug it in here. We compute its mass of these guys, and we get a half minus A and S. And we get okay. This is a mass square, but this guy, there is nothing else at this level. That's it. There are no more states, and therefore this state is a vector of S O D minus two, which is the little group for massless particles in d dimensions. And since there is nothing else in that sector, this guy has to be a massless representation of SOD, of the Poincaré group in D dimensions. But if this guy has to be massless due to Lorentz invariance, sadly, yeah, he's laughing. Uh, Ali is laughing. It's, I told you, <laughs> you're going to get attacking, he said. Yeah, so this guy becomes attacking. Okay, too bad. At least it's an open string pack, right? We're doing the open string now, remember. <coughs> How about the Ramon sector? Well, in the Ramon sector, the vacuum
qué te enojes? But we found from the constraint that the vacuum, if we have Lorentz invariance, the vacuum has to be a massless Dirac spinner. And therefore, finally, we get something sensible. So the normal, or the ordering ambiguity happens to be zero, and the lowest state, the vacuum, is a massless particle. Well, that we knew already from there, but it means that this guy has to be zero. Okay. So n equals one. I told you we have to do many things today, so that would be an exercise. All right. <coughs> Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen. Any suggestions? Try again. I've done. So last time we said, well, this is an indication that for in general, the, the quantization procedure can spoil or can produce an anomaly that will spoil Lorentz invariant. So we had to check, and we went on and said, well, you have to check the only way to be completely sure that everything will work out nicely is to check the Lorentz algebra and make sure that it's satisfied as quantum operators. Okay? So you could do that, or in this case, we're going to proceed with a shortcut. So the other procedure has been done, and it gives a specific value for D in both sectors, okay? Which turns out to agree, they turn out to be the same. But now we're going to do something different. We're going to try to be brave and try to tame the ordering ambiguity. or it should be called taming. <coughs> so where does the ordering ambiguity come from? Well, first it comes from the commutators or anti-commutators. So let's consider the NS sector. There is something funny about this commutator already. Right? What's funny about this commutator is that as you take m to be, well, first of all, let's rewrite this commutator in the case of interest. First of all, we only have transfer indices. Okay? And let's write it only in the case where we're going to get something non zero. Okay? So the two indices must be the same. So we get something like this. Okay. Remember, these are only transverse indices, so the metric gives us a plus sign. And the same thing for these guys. Yes, thank you. Same thing here. Now, there is something funny about this commutator. If you go for very, very large m, 
this commutator starts to be very, very large, right? So you could imagine even saying, well, if the Planck scale, if the Planck constant is fixed, you can even take m to be much larger than that. So that's that's kind of funny. So what I want to do is to propose a regularization of this. So I want to say, well, let's pretend that we're doing something that regulates this thing, okay? And since I'm doing that here, I'm also going to be doing that here. And then at the end, in any physical computation, we will take the limit epsilon goes to zero. Okay? Should That's I what be, we will do. Should I be at R in this thing? Yes, thank you. That's actually very important. All right. So what do we want to do? We want to start, I said we're going to, we're going to try to be brave, and start with a classical number operator. So what would be our classical number operator? It would be something of the form one half sum over all n different from zero alpha i alpha i minus n n. And we are in the navier schwarz sector, so we get this thing here. <laughs> so what's the difference between this classical version and the quantum version we had over there? The difference is that here, we are summing over all oscillators. We don't have any reason to sum over only half of the sector. Okay. Likewise, here, we are summing over all z, all possible integer values for r. Now, when we want to go to the quantum version, <coughs> we can take the approach that we are performing a symmetric ordering prescription, which means that we are taking every creation and annihilation operator that appears, and if they appear, in one order, we also take the other order. Okay, so that's a symmetric approach. We don't know what ordering we should choose. Let's just choose, oh, and there is also some over i here. Let's just choose the symmetric one. Okay, but when we choose the symmetric one, It is natural, well, if we choose a symmetric one and we want to connect it or we want to compare this to our quantum to our quantum operator, right, that we have over there, that we have here. This is our quantum operator. It is convenient to first separate this sum into two pieces. So for n greater than zero. And the sum for n less than zero. Okay, this is a piece that looks like what we had in the quantum operator, or this is our approach for the quantum operator, coming from this classical version. Here we're going to have sum over r from a half to infinity, <coughs> r d minus r plus the rest, so that would be R. So the rest would be all possible negative values for this entry here. So this is important. I'm going to write this sum over Z explicitly. Okay, so I'm going to introduce an N in order to write the sum. So I'm going to use N less than zero and put N plus a half, okay? 
instead of r, I'm going to put n here, and I'm going to put n plus a half and sum over n less than zero. B minus, well, here is the price I have to pay. I have to put a, explicitly all that there. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So if I want to connect to our to our Navier-Schwartz um, quantum operator, what do I have to do? Well, I have to write everything in terms of the mode of the, of the structure that appears there with a the normal ordering. So I have to flip the ordering here to make it look like this, and I have to flip the ordering here to make it look like this. So what am I going to use? I'm going to use my regulators, my regulated commutation relations. So let's do it. Okay. Well, you see that if I use the commutator, the commutator there, I can take this, commute every one of these guys. I'll produce one term that looks exactly like this, and I will produce something that comes from the commutator. So what I'm going to get is something that looks like our n quantum looks like one half sum over i two times what we like okay plus the sum from n equals to one to infinity of n e to the minus n epsilon. Okay. How about the other piece? Well, the other piece will give us something similar to that. Two times sum over r bi bi minus r r for r from a half to infinity. So these two pieces, together with the two and the half, will give us what we were looking for. And here, we will also pay a price. But note that there is something very, very important here. When we fix this sign... Okay. When we fix this, in order to bring it to this form, right? Remember that there is this piece here, and these ends are negative. Okay. So we will pay a minus sign, not from the anti-commutator, but in order to translate this into a sum over n positive, we will have to put a minus sign. So I want to change that sum for something that is positive. And in order to do that, I'll have to put a minus sign if I want to put this over positive ends. So this minus sign and this change of range is connected to the fact that there is an end here. Okay? So that minus sign will actually be crucial. All right, very good. So, we see that this piece, as I said, together with this, they give us our N, N, S. Okay. And we said from the beginning that our quantum version of the number operator had to be ns minus a and s, right? We had to allow for this ordering ambiguity. Therefore, minus a and s has to be equal to this half sum over i1 d minus 2 sum over Okay, one coming from this piece and the other one coming from this piece, which I told you has this minus sign in it. Should 
Shouldn't there be what? Ten minus seven, not five. No, do it carefully. You will see. Just, just spl explicitly write down these guys, right? So the first one is minus one, right? But minus one give you, yeah. gives you a half. Yeah, but oh, very good. That's very important. It's equal to zero to infinity. Excellent. Yeah, without the equal, it actually doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. That was very, very important. Yeah, that, that single term is actually crucial. OK, very good. So we now have to compute this and then take the limit, as I suggested. <coughs> so let's do that. Um, So in order to, to kill two birds with the same stone, right, we need to compute these two things. So why don't we compute something more general, or a slightly more general? OK. In fact, if we set alpha equal to 0, we get this term, because this sum can also be taken from 0. There is an n, so that term doesn't contribute. And the other one will just give us a half. If we put alpha equals to a half, we will be done. Right? So the trick to compute this is very simple. We say, well, this looks like minus the derivative with respect to epsilon of the sum from n equals to 0 to infinity of e to the minus n plus alpha epsilon. And we know what this is, right? <clears throat> so it's just a little computation you can do. That's what you get. <clears throat> now you take the derivative and you expand. around epsilon equals to 0. After all, that's what we want to do, right? We want to take the limit when epsilon goes to 0. So we want to expand in a Laurent expansion around epsilon equals to 0. And what do we get? We get 1 over epsilon squared minus 1 twelfth of 1 minus 6 alpha plus 6 alpha squared plus order epsilon. OK? That's what we get. Very good. So let's use our formula over there, right? So we concluded that <coughs> we concluded that our order ambiguity in the Navier-Schwarz sector is equal to. So we had a minus sign, so we have to put the minus sign on the other side. On the other side, is minus a half times this function evaluated at alpha equals to zero. So we get one over epsilon square. This evaluated at alpha equals to 0, we get minus a 12, minus the same function but evaluated now at alpha equals to a half. So we get 1 over epsilon squared. And we plug that there, we get minus a 1 12, 1 minus 3 plus 6 quarters. Now you see why the minus sign is crucial. You see what the minus sign does? It kills these two terms. What do we find? We find minus a half minus a 12. And you do this computation, and you get minus 1 over 24. Yes? What happens to this one with, uh, over i? 
Oh, excellent. That's very important. <laughs> yes. You see that nothing here depends on i, right? So the sum will give us a factor of t minus 2. Thank you. <laughs> I was too excited to, to notice that I was missing the d minus 2. OK? That's what we get. And this thing is equal to d minus 2 over 2 times 3 over 24. But Lorentz invariance already told us what this had to be, right? We had no choice but to set this thing to be a half. So Lorentz invariance could only be maintained or at least a necessary condition was to set a and s to be a half. And therefore, we find that d minus 2 has to be equal to 8, and d has to be equal to 10. So nobody's saying anything because you're all in shock? Or <laughs> <laughs> so the space-time dimension for our super string turns out to be 10. So that's much better than 26. In fact, it's not that crazy, right? Because we hope that somehow this will have to do with supersymmetry. So supersymmetry. We already know that 26 is too high of a dimension for supersymmetry to be there. So we needed something actually less than 11. The bad thing is that we didn't get 11. So 11 would have been much more interesting. Something like, oh, yeah, there is a sign that there is something spectacular going on. But well, we will see that there is something spectacular going on. But um, it's not as straightforward to see it. Okay? Now there is something really, really interesting here. Not the following. If you look at this formula, yes, this is, this is just a curiosity. Look at this derivation. You see that this looks like the contribution from the bosons, right? And this like the contribution from the fermions, right? These guys came from the Bs. These guys came from the alphas. Suppose that you drop this. You say, well, let's just drop this guy and see what I get. Of course, you are not supposed to do that because we cancel this, pole, this double pole from the two pieces. But just out of curiosity, let's take this guy and cancel this guy. Pretend that this guy is not here and recompute D. What do you find? 26. 26. <laughs> so, so if you naively drop the 1 over 24th, and keep the minus at 12 as the bosonic contribution, and repeat the same computation, you will find that d for the bosonic case is 26. Uh, do you have to change a? Yeah, of course, you have to change a. I mean, there is no now usual circuit, and, and take a equals to 1. <laughs> Very good. OK. You will find that this is true. So that means that there must be some way of regularizing the computation and renormalizing away this infinity so that you get this, this answer. Or at least it suggests that such a thing is possible. OK. So I will be tempted to end the lecture here, but Ali won't be able to, 
to, to, to concentrate today, right? Because there is a tachyon. How can you live thinking that there is a tachyon? So we have to do something about that. What is the tachyon? Here is the tachyon. Yeah, so I don't want to erase this. <laughs> By the way, this cancellation that you're seeing here is a manifestation of something that happens many, many times. So bosons and fermions end up canceling infinities. So this shows that the NSS sector almost wants to be supersymmetric. It fails to be supersymmetric because we don't get zero, right? How about the Ramon sector? Look at the Ramon sector. What are you going to get if you repeat the same thing? Zero. You get zero, precisely. You see that the bosons and the fermions precisely will pair up, and every time you, permute, you, you commute one and anti-commute the other one, you get exactly the same contribution with different signs. So they will cancel out, giving you something consistent with the fact that we found that the, norm, that the order and ambiguity had to be zero. So this is really manifestation of supersymmetry on the world sheet. So it means that the Ramon boundary conditions preserve supersymmetry on the world sheet, and the Navier-Schwarz boundary conditions don't quite do that. Okay? Finally, let's see what to do with this stack. I won't be able to get the spelling correctly if I don't look at it. So we could, we could call Alice heroes would be Gliosi, Shirk, and Olive. Or for short, we call them, we call this GSO construction. So GSO came up with this brilliant idea. And they said, well, we have this tachyon. <coughs> and moreover, it would be nice to have some sort of matching between degrees of freedom in the Ramon sector and the Navier-Schwarz sector for reasons that we will explain tomorrow. I don't want to go into that today, but tomorrow we will discuss why it's important. So they introduce an operator. I don't know if the G is, is after him, but maybe. So in the Navier-Schwar sector, they introduce an operator that looks like this. where this operator F is something that counts the number of fermionic oscillators. It's not a number operator. It's something that counts just the number of Bs in a given physical state. Remember, now we are constructing the physical states by acting on the vacuum with oscillators, right? Alphas and Bs. And this is something designed so that you count how many of them there are. In the Ramon sector, it turns out that the operator that you have to use, well, it's the same thing. It's something that counts the number of Bs. In the Ramon sector, one has to do something slightly more complicated than in the, than in the Navier-Schwarz sector. And what they found was that 
You don't want to keep both chiralities for the ground state. Now the dimension, now the dimension is 10, right? So this is an infinity and this is an 8 because it's 10 minus 2. So we are now in 10 dimensions, right? So our vacuum is a spinner, so it can have two chiralities. It can be positive chirality and negative chirality. Okay? And how do you choose the chirality, or how do you test the chirality of something? Well, you do it with... So where do I put the index down? With gamma 11. We are in 10 dimensions, so you can construct a gamma 11. And what this guy gives you is a test of the chirality of your spinners. Okay, so these are the operators. So what did they do? They simply declare that physical states have physical states, let's call them phi, or the only states that will make your physical theory eigenvalue plus one of this operator and the same thing for the Ramon sect. Well, this clearly does the job of declaring that the tachyon is not physical, right? Because the tachyon, our tachyon in the Navier-Schwarz sector had a B, and this thing counts the number of Bs. Sorry? The, yeah, very good. I thought, hmm, this is giving me plus one. <laughs> so that's funny. <laughs> the vacuum doesn't have any Bs. <laughs> right. So the number of Bs is zero. So F is zero. And with this minus sign, we get a minus, uh, we get a minus sign. And according to GSO, you should throw that from the spectrum. Of course, one thing is what GSO say, and another thing is what the theory wants you to do. Right? So... Why people were excited about, GS, about this GSO projection? I mean, you could just have come out with, a, with another crazy idea, something like every time you have a number operator that is even, throw that out, right? That would have been a possible projection operator that eliminates the tachyon. But what is surprising about the GSO projection is that once you do that, the structure of interactions is still consistent with the projection. So if you only take the states that satisfy this and scatter them, you will only produce, just pretend that you haven't done anything. Just that in the, in the original states, in the in states, you only put the states that satisfy this property. You scatter them, and the theory only produces for you states that satisfy this property. So this is a consistent truncation of the theory. It's a consistent projection of the theory. It's as if the two theories were coexisting simultaneously. The guys with, with, with eigenvalue plus and the guys with eigenvalue minus. So it's consistent to just separate them and throw one away. Yes? But uh, can't they have something like loops and then have the other states, other states circulating in the loops when you scatter them? Yeah, you could think about that. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that even at loops, you still get, um, in order to satisfy, remember, the whole, the, the whole idea that we had at the beginning was that we wanted to preserve conformal invariance at all costs, right? Because that's the thing that would imply that we have a consistent theory. So if you throw out all these other states, sorry, if you allow them to even to run in loops, you will spoil conformal invariance at loop level. So that's another problem that you have to solve. So, and that problem, that problem is also solved by the GSO projection. So conformal invariance at loop level is called modular invariance. So modular invariance is only preserved if you introduce this thing in there. So we could have discovered that if we didn't want to, to throw away the tachyon from the beginning, we could have said, 
well, let's just keep going and let's compute a one-loop con one loop amplitude. And we have found that it has a conformal anomaly in the form of a modular invariance anomaly. And then try to find a way of defining a theory that will preserve conformal invariance, just like what we did with the dimension. Remember, the dimension had to be 10, and A had to be a half in this sector in order to preserve, really, conformal invariance. Because we concluded that the Lorentz invariant anomaly was a signal that there was an anomaly in conformal invariance. Okay? So while it's true that you could have produced that, we really have to project them out in order to keep modular invariance at one loop. Okay? So very good. So once we do that, the physical states of the superstrings, so let me summarize, and we can stop here. So the summary <coughs> is that the physical RNS open string theory has to live in nine plus one dimensions. Okay? It has two sectors, the NS sector, the Ramon sector. And the massless states The first, the lowest lying states are all massless after GSO projection. So this is by physical here, I mean after GSO. So we can produce a physical theory that is consistent with interactions. And in the Navier-Schwarz sector, what we got was a gauge boson. In a space-time, And in the Ramon sector, we got, let me denote it by lambda, a Majorana bile spinner. Because the GSO projection actually chooses one or the other. So it makes one choice for the chirality of the vacuum, and therefore the state is a bile spinner. Okay? And the Majorana condition is something that we impose from the beginning on the wall sheet, and that translates into the same condition on the space-time fermion. So luckily, we found that the dimension was 10, and 10 allows us to have Majorana and Weil spins. <laughs> okay. So maybe an exercise for you today. is to count the number of degrees of freedom of these guys, or the, of the bosons here, and the number of degrees of freedoms of these guys. Okay? Remember that this guy has to satisfy the Dirac equation, the massless Dirac equation. So count the number of degrees, the number of degrees of freedom for both sectors. Okay? And tomorrow we will write down what the low energy effective action of this theory is that makes these guys and these guys interact in space time. Okay? And that will be our first 10 dimensional action. And we will continue with the closed string after we do that. All right? <laughs>